Oh boy. We have the biggest giveaway we've done in our YouTube channel's history. Now here's why, before I tell you what we're going to give you, here's what happened. We recorded this amazing podcast, okay? Today's podcast is great, controversial. It's about full range of motion. It's a debate. Should you full do full squats? Should you do half squats? Are bodybuilders right? Are athletic coaches right? We dive deep into this conversation. Great podcast. The cameras went off. So in other words, today's podcast is audio only. There's no video. So we feel real bad about this, which is why we're going to do the biggest giveaway we've ever done ever. First off, here's how you can win the following prize. The prize is a super bundle. This is the biggest program bundle that we offer. It includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Anywhere, MAPS Prime, Kettlebell for Aesthetics. You have the Build Your Butt uh, mod that's available in there and the Sexy Athlete mod. All of those are in this bundle. You'll get all of those for free, but you got to do the following. Listen to the whole podcast, okay? So from beginning to end, in the comments in the first 24 hours, tell us your thoughts. Do you agree with us or do you agree with people who say you didn't you don't need to do full range of motion training? Start a nice conversation in the comments, okay? It's got to happen in the first 24 hours. We'll go through the comments, we'll pick the best one, and if you win, you get the super bundle. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Uh, by the way, we are also running a sale. So we have MAPS Anabolic, that's 50% off. We also have our Shredded Summer Bundle, that's 50% off. You can find those at mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code April Special. All right, enjoy this podcast. So you know our friend Ben Pollock, right? Yeah. Uh, power lifter turned bodybuilder. Love Ben. Yeah, smart guy, um, and he's uh, built an incredible physique. The guy's gaining crazy mu amounts of muscle lately. But anyway, he screenshotted a comment. Oh, you're going to go here. Yeah, and put it up, and then it started this whole like back and forth between people. So the mm. screenshot came from, and you got you know who this page is. Yeah, I got From uh, Lift Run Bang. Yeah, great name. Yeah. Live from Bang. Yeah. <laughs> this, by the way, that guy's super sensitive. So be careful if you comment and you say the wrong thing, he'll whatever, lose his mind. But anyway, his comment that that Ben uh, screenshotted says a large range of motion for the sake of more range of motion is disadvantageous for hypertrophy because all muscles have a limited active range of motion in a movement. Once the range of motion exceeds that, then something else has to compensate for that extra range of motion. Just so many bad comments and interpretations about hypertrophy in here. Uh, by the way, the guy sounds smart. Um, no, he's a smart guy. And yeah. here's the thing. The, the statement in itself is not incorrect. Wrong. Do you have my comment back? In there? Well, I'm going to read both. So okay. I read mine and I'll read yours, right? Because uh, what he's saying is... It's, I guess the way he's saying it might be true, but so here's my, my, what I said underneath it. I said, so long as the range of motion is under control with good stability and connection, okay, so that's the context, okay, then a greater range of motion generally leads to more muscle growth and a larger range of strength spanning over a greater range of motion. In other words, deep squats, so long as the person doing them has good mobility, connection, and stability will build more overall muscle and broader strength than shallow squats. By the way, all the evidence, all the data uh, proves what I'm saying. And, but remember, I'm saying generally more muscle, more connection, all that stuff. Adam caught me, and that, of course, irritated uh, the sensitive guy, so he had to come back. But then Adam came, and he says, I guess the question I have here is, who are we trying to help? We seem to have attracted several fitness intellects that want to debate all the nuances of biomechanics for the sake of being more right. Meanwhile, losing the majority in the weeds or worse, justifying why we should not address our shit mobility so long as our pursuit is to build more muscle. When I see posts like this, I'm always curious to what the desired outcome is. Um, I, I, I mean, I, of I agree 100% with what you're saying. Of course, I agree with what I'm saying. Yeah. So the, the debate is over range of motion. It's still a debate. And usually the side that argues against range of motion are, comes from the bodybuilding mm -hmm. space where they'll say that uh, too much range of motion takes tension off the target muscle, right. results in less muscle so growth. So is, is that the main thing, that they just feel like they're losing a bit of tension once they exceed a certain range of motion? And so therefore, in terms of hypertrophy, it, it seems like it's no, useless. No, no. It's because they have shit mobility and they can't get... you know. And here's how I can, and why I like to speak to this one. And this one I'm, I feel passionate about. Because I was this guy. 
like literally I, I love to attach myself to someone like this that was preaching some of like this because I had poor mobility. I couldn't squat past 90 degrees very well. And it, and it made me feel good about it. Like, oh yeah, I don't need to. Mm-hmm. I don't need to. And you had all the accolades to back you up. Right. You were a pro IFBB physique competitor. So you had developed this incredible physique. So why would you want to listen to anything right. else? And, 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 and they're right. You don't necessarily have to, to build that. But I tell you what, when I began to work on my ankle and hip mobility and, and my, my squat depth, so many other positive things besides just building muscle. So by the way, the first thing I think is untrue and what your statement I do believe is true. Once I got to the place where I had good stability and control in a deeper range of motion and it could do a full astagrass squat, I was able to build more muscle in my legs with less effort Mm -hmm. by doing that. I noticed that right away. And then I also noticed all the other benefits, like my back pain going away, like the ability to sit down comfortably and play with my son and do things that I couldn't do before because I wasn't addressing mobility. So that's why I came out with a statement saying that I just don't understand the desired outcome when you say something like this because a 20-year-old me reads that looks at this guy who looks impressive and I go, oh man, he, yeah, okay, yeah, fuck that. I don't need to go any deeper Like, because all I care about is looking good and building muscle. And so I neglect working on my mobility in pursuit of wanting this great physique. But um, then I get caught up with all this other bullshit. 100%. And, and again, here's the, the deal is because he's saying past a certain range of motion, you if you lose connection to the target muscle, well, yeah, uh, you, you don't train in a range of motion that you don't have connection to and that you don't own. Right. That's what mobility is, right? So if you squat to 90 degrees and if you go below 90 degrees and all of a sudden you lose connection and stability, that greater range of motion is not going to be better for you. Right? Right. It's going to be worse for you. Right. So what we're saying is not greater range of motion at all costs. What we're saying is a greater range of motion that you're connected to is better for overall muscle growth, oh, by the way, overall strength too, because here's the deal. The strength that you gain when you when you do exercise, most of it goes to the range of motion that you train. So in other words, if I squat to 90 degrees and I mm-hmm. add 100 pounds to my squat, most of that strength is in that range of motion that I train. There's some carryover outside of 90 degrees, but the further I move away from that, the more the less of that strength that I get. In other words, if you can squat 300 pounds at 90 degrees, you're not going to be able to squat 300 pounds ass to grass. You'll be lucky to squat 220 pounds right. ass to grass, especially if your mobility is poor. So being connected is the, 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 that's where you have to be. And if you're connected and you own the movement, greater ranges of motion are superior. And again, the data is clear on this. It's very, very clear. Um, but again, I, I think sometimes we get these like really small groups of nuanced individuals. And, we, and I think we should talk about cases where shorter ranges of motion uh, maybe beneficial or where larger ranges of motion aren't necessarily uh, beneficial to some, you know, in right. Some so s- if you're situation. talking about like sports specific uh, instances, like so everybody's familiar with a LeBron James squat, like the quarter squat, and it was getting like just fire blazed because of that. And if you think about it, like where are you going to generate the most amount of power when you're on the court and when you're about to jump and when you're going to be the most explosive? So, you know, really training that specific range of motion to generate the most amount of force makes sense in that specific type. Of, of, of direction. Absolutely. And, and, and a note about athletes, if you watch good athletes train with good coaches, they are not training for optimal health, uh, optimal That's mobility, right. optimal, uh, you know, overall, like, you know, real life strength. What they're training for is sports specific performance, which is not usually not the healthiest best way for most people to train. It's yeah. almost always not. Right. Right. We had a great discussion with our, our buddy, uh, Dr. Justin Brink a long time ago. Do you remember this when we talked yes. about him training professional athletes mm. and we were like, what do you do? What, like, what do you do when you get like this fighter and he's got all this like dis- forward shoulder? Yeah. And he's got this discrepancy between right and yeah. left. Right. Start all over and do all new recruitment patterns. Or- right. His feet are pronating bad. He's got all this dysfunction and breakdown stuff that he's helped me out with. Like, what do you do when you see that with this UFC fighter? Like, mm-hmm. and he's like, you know, in a case like that, you have to be very careful because yeah, you want to help him out with some things that you know that you see that are glaring, that are obvious issues that he's got or he's going to cause issues down the road. But that's at the same token, you gotta 
you have this fine dance of, I also don't want to reduce his performance when he gets into the ring. The, he's been moving. Right. He or she, that athlete, has been moving that way for so long. They're really good at it. Yep. And you don't want to reach, you don't want to completely change their movement patterns because because they'll lose performance. And athletes, it's all about performance, especially at the professional level. LeBron James right. could give a shit about building maximum mass on his legs. What he wants to do is be a better Basketball player, obviously. That makes sense. So you're going to train in a very, very specific way, in which case training in specific ranges of motion makes perfect sense. Okay, all that said, the lift, run, bang guy, I mean, was he really trying to voice this out to competitive bodybuilders, or was he saying this is a statement well, in general? Well, so th and, th and that was that goes back to my statement of, like, what you know, my thing that I – when I read something like that, I go, okay, what's the desired outcome of this post? Right. Is it I'm only speaking to very com high level competitive bodybuilders? Which I'd I'm, put in the same category as like athletes, right? Pro athletes. Correct. Or whatever. Right. And that's and all you are and we are getting that crazy and splitting hair difference on that that information. Um, okay, I understand that. But I mean the dude's got uh, well over a hundred thousand, I believe, followers. Right? Or was he, was yeah. he that big? Yeah, yeah I think I know, so. He's got a decent amount of following. I know he writes for uh, T Nation too. Right? He has a few times. Yeah. So he he has he has a very large audience. Okay, bodybuilders, are the one percent. You know what I'm saying? One percent. You can't you can't tell me. And let's just say he's geared his his, his conversation around that ninety nine percent of the time. So he's attracted more bodybuilders. That person, I don't care. There's you still don't have. 80% of your followers are, are professional bodybuilders. Most of these people that are following were probably kids just like me in their 20s mm -hmm. that are aspiring to look like this guy, and he's talking real smart, so he sounds like he knows a lot of information. And he does. He writes for T Nation. The dude's a smart guy. He knows what he's talking about. And I don't disagree necessarily with the statement that he's saying. It's just that I you got to understand how, and this is what, this is the difference between being a personal trainer and a coach when you've communicated message, the same message right. a thousand times over to clients, you start to realize like- What are the behaviors that follow this? That's right, and and, and how, does the, how does the client receive that information? Like, you, I mean, you don't use the jargon that you learn in school or reading your national certifications to a client because you know that they'll never receive it correctly and apply it right. Yes. Yeah. So I have to use layman's terms to get a, get a very complex piece of information delivered to them so they can disseminate it and then apply it to their life. And when you, when you talk on social media and you post something like this, when th tens of thousands, potentially millions of people are listening and watching, to think that you're not losing 90% of those people in the weeds because they don't understand biomechanics at that level. And all it really does is tell that young kid that goes, oh yeah, see, I don't need to squat past 90 degrees because I really care mostly about yeah. looking bigger and more and more buff. And meanwhile, right. they don't, uh, they're not able to build as much muscle. They're not able to look as good as mm -hmm. they could had they worked on that mobility because here's the other argument. They'll say, oh, well, you know, yeah, he might be talking to bodybuilders, but a lot of the people just want to build a lot of muscle. So that information must apply to them too. No, no, it doesn't. You take a hundred people who really want to build a lot of muscle, average people, okay, who really want to build a lot of muscle. Out of that hundred people, you might be lucky enough to find one, probably not even one, but you might be lucky enough to find one who if, if could fall in that category of pro bodybuilder genetics and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The vast majority are going to do better with the same stuff that you would apply towards the average person. Full range of motion, control, mobility, comp, you know, uh, compound movements over isolation movements. They're still going to do the best with that kind of stuff. That information applies to such a small percentage of people, but even even the way he was communicating, even mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, if the muscle loses tension, well, yeah, you, you, range of motion is we nothing- have to work with, on that. It's, not, it's nothing without connection. That's not right. mobility. That's just going deeper. Well, and this is to the problem. I know we all had this, um, we, we went through a lot of different certifications that limited that, limited yes. to 90 degrees, like a limited, so you couldn't bring any weight behind your, your neck. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of things where range of motion was considered like this is going to hurt and harm your clients and so we're going to we're, we're not going to pursue anything you know past 90 degrees and you know the the further i got along my career you know that started to make less and less sense the more back pain the more knee pain all these different things that were uh you know happening 
based off of a lack of strength. And now, you know, like really pursuing mobility and seeing how you can increase strength gradually through range of motion, like what that did in terms of pain alleviation, overall strength, building muscle, it was it was totally in, in stark contrast to what we learned. Yeah, this, these national certifications, I remember taking them and I remember uh, my first one, I'm in the class and the instructor goes, when you bench press, you only need to come down to uh, where your arm, the back of your arms are parallel to the floor. So you want to come down to here. You don't want to go all the way down. And then he would have like a, he had like a, a mannequin or whatever, like a skeleton. Mm -hmm. And he goes, look what happens to the shoulder joint when you go all the way down. And all these problems can happen. I remember listening to him going, oh shit, okay. Like, wow. And yeah. also thinking in my head, like I can bench way more now because I don't have to go all the way down. Like this is actually really cool. Now here's why the certifications uh, taught that. These are huge organizations. I mean, NASM Safety. educates hundreds of thousands of people. Um, they're represented in some of the biggest gym chains in the world. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to weigh risk versus reward. Now, mm -hmm. the risk of teaching trainers to train their clients with greater range of motion is, are these new trainers going to know enough to be able to get their clients to get better ranges of motion with good control and good stability. Because that requires another level of education and understanding. Or is the risk too high because there are a lot of them are new trainers. And sure. if we tell these trainers that going all the way down with a bench press is good and they don't know the difference and they're just going to force their clients to go all the way down, that's going to increase risk of injury. Mm -hmm. We may be liable. Maybe 24 Hour Fitness will stop accepting us as a certification. So it's better to err on the side of safety and it's better to tell these trainers to do this because it's better than nothing. A client doing 90 degree squats is better than not doing squats at all and it makes uh, you know makes more sense from that standpoint. But the truth is uh, you want better results, you want to move better. You, you Your goal should be to increase your range of motion in an appropriate way because that's the way that your body moves. Here's one of the problems with training with limited ranges of motion. Let's say you only ever squat to 90 degrees or shoulder press to 90 degrees or whatever. That's all you ever do. Most of the strength that you gain through the years of training is within that range of motion. And what ends up happening is when you go outside of that range of motion, yeah. you lose strength and you lose stability. So now this actually increases your risk of injury in the real world because let's say, I don't know, let's say Justin's moving and he's like, hey, Sal, can you come help me? move some stuff. I got, you know, I got some heavy boxes. I got a bed, you know, frame mm -hmm. and I'm lifting the bed frame. We're trying to get it up on, on top of something. And I just so happen to go below 90 degrees. Now I'm strong enough to hold it up here, but for a second I go below 90 and next thing you know, boom, I hurt my shoulder yep. or I, I'm down playing with my kids and I got to get up quickly because my kid's going to fall or something, but I'm below 90 degrees. I got all the strength outside of it, but I have low, bad stability below. Boom. I hurt my back. Mm -hmm. This is why you get a lot of these gym rats that injured themselves outside of the gym. I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories of people who in the gym are just you know incredible with their strength and whatever, and then they hurt their back. Yeah. Like, how'd you hurt your shoulder? I was throwing a frisbee, yeah. or uh, my dog pulled me this way and I had to twist and I popped my. It's so or weird. they just lose focus for one second in the gym and they go just you know that that little bit lower than they normally would and, and they're just in, un, in unstable uh, area now where they don't have the strength to pull themselves out and, mm -hmm. and inevitably either you dump the weight or you get hurt. That's why I wish posts like this would come with like a warning right or because here's the thing again going back to me being a, a 20 year old kid that would have read something like this and, and jumped all over and been like yeah I'm not, I'm not squatting deeper than 90 degrees is if you asked me Adam, you know, you could build as much or more muscle just by squatting down to 90 degrees. That's the way to go. But you may risk having chronic back pain when you get close to 30 and in mobile hips. And you may not be able to squat down in a, in a deep squat and play with your son when you're yeah. 35, 40 years Worth old. It. Yeah. Would you, if that, that may happen if we don't address these things right now and we just keep pursuing just building maximal muscle and we just will shorten the range of motion up. Do you still want to do that? I think I, I I would have had the foresight to be like, okay, I don't want to sacrifice all that. Can I still build a lot of muscle? That's the question. Yeah. Am I sacrificing muscle yeah. for mm. getting a more mobility and a more connected, larger yeah, range of motion? Yeah, talk about that. No, you're not sac sacrificing nope. muscle. You actually will build more muscle. And again, the studies completely support this. So when people say, oh, if you go below 90, like here's a good example. We use the shoulder press because this is this one I hear all the time. You'll see 
you know, uh, bodybuilders do this kind of like go down to 90 degrees, come up. They don't even fully extend, so they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, you know, oh, it's to maintain tension right. in my shoulder. You're feeling that constant okay. squeeze. The reason why people say they feel more tension doing that is because they have poor connection at the bottom and they have poor connection at the top. Mm -hmm. The truth is, at the top... I can, and you as a bodybuilder, if you're a bodybuilder, this is your job. Like, literally, this is your job when you train. Your job should be to know how to connect to your muscle at any given moment. That's what bodybuilders do best. Right. If you're fully extended up here, it's your job to connect to the shoulder. Like right now, I'm connecting my shoulder. If you're at the bottom, don't let the weight just sit on your arm. Right. Connect and activate the shoulder. The shoulder can be, you can have tension on the shoulder through the entire range of motion. The goal is not to lock out, allow your joints to support the weight. Nobody ever says that. Right. Mm -hmm. You can maintain tension. Can I keep tension on my quads mm. at the bottom of a squat? I can. Can I take tension off my quads at the bottom of a squat? Well, yeah, if I sit on my, my calves and I'm relaxing. Right. But you should never do that with an exercise. There's never a case with an exercise unless the weight is on the floor. And even then I say maintain tension. You should never, in any range of motion of any exercise, lose tension to it. Never relax in any position, whether it's full extension, fully extended, or or not. That you takes discipline. That's a way yes. of training, and, and you know to to eliminate that from the conversation is is ridiculous. So it again, like it, to to Adams or, or I don't know whoever's point, but it was like you know it, to me it just it, it it speaks of kind of a lazy approach. Like okay, so we're just going to eliminate the fact that you can do all these things and not have to like apply aids. I'm not going to have to have things that are supporting me in certain ranges of motion because I haven't put the work in to actually. Control control and own that part. Well, really, it's just trying to be contrarian. I mean, it's really knowing that it's clickbaity to say something like that, because there's going to be a, a massive amount of, of trainers that know better that are going to speak out. And then there's going to be a group of people that are going to want to jump on that bandwagon. That sounds good. And, and again, this is one of these things that really annoys me about our space is that that conversation is such a high level conversation for most people it's so above everybody the average gym goer it's above their pay grade like sure. you, that you don't i would never have that conversation with somebody in the first three years of training them like there's no reason to even go there like we have so much stuff we need to learn and work on so when you post things out like that you just it's irresponsible in my opinion it's and it's not that much different than the other debate that we get into which is the people that like to debate that you know, uh, squatting, barbell back squatting is not necessary and you don't need to do it. And in fact, there's other exercises like hack squats that will build your quads more. I just think it's a, a bad message. C can you argue that? Yeah, you can make the argument for it. Do I think it's true? No, I don't think it's true. And I think it's, a, and more importantly, I think it's a bad message because there's so many health benefits and longevity benefits to learning how to squat properly. It's such a functional movement. I mean, off air, when we were originally talking about this episode, you know, Doug talked because Doug's been working a lot the last like two years. I don't know if it was uh, watching my mobility increase or whatever like that that inspired him or whatever, but I know he started to really pursue his, his uh, uh, range of motion on his squat depth. And the, the thing that he's r reported back is the exact same thing that I noticed. I had chronic back pain mm -hmm. for most of my 30s. Like Squatting I'm, deeper made it go away. Squatting deeper made it go away. Yeah, but of course, properly, right? Right. Yeah, and yeah. what that was, was the pursuit of getting to that this squat. Yes. It wasn't actually just dropping down into a, a, a full squat. No, that's how you hurt yourself. Exactly. That didn't get rid of my low back pain. It was every day working on my hip mobility, every day working on my ankle mobility, then that allowed me to get into a deep range of motion squat that I could control. That was supported. And now what's beautiful is I don't do all that mobility stuff anymore. Now all I have to do is do good deep squats and it addresses my hip mobility and addresses my ankle mobility. And that the ben and then on and then guess what? As a as a sidebar I've built as much or more muscle in my legs with less effort than what I was doing in the shorter range of motion. Yeah, I'm glad you said that too because uh, you have that. This is very important. It's not for just the sake of range of range of motion. It's you have to do it with good control, good stability, and good mobility. And if your range of if you're trying to increase that range of motion, it means you need to work on those things. Once those things are there. Now you have a greater range of motion, not just going deeper, not just having a larger range of motion, because if you don't own it, you're going to hurt yourself. But, you know, back to the argument of the shorter range versus the longer range, what builds more muscle? Look, as a trainer, I would get clients all the time, people who are deconditioned who, I mean, 
they couldn't even do a half squat without feeling pain, right? So they, they couldn't even go down to parallel mm -hmm. and they would do pain. Now, did I say to them, that's okay, we'll just do five inches and we'll just continue to load that because that's your range of motion? Of course right. not. Now, nobody would say that. That's not going to give them great results at all. If anything, that'll make things much worse. So my goal was to continue to increase the range of motion. But for some reason, all of a sudden, 90 degrees becomes the, that's, oh, no, no. It's good to go deeper, but 90 degrees is where we want to stop. And you ever wonder why, where 90 degrees came from? Where, where's that, where's that number come from? They made that shit up. You know what the truth is? The mm -hmm. truth is a squat is a fundamental human movement. And the truth is there's full squats and that's it. Right. Everything other than that is, is, is less than a full squat. But the 90 degrees, I think it's because for most people who train, once they hit 90 degrees, going beyond that requires a little bit more work, a little bit more effort, and more focus well, on mobility. When you sit in a chair and you sit on the toilet, is it's that 90 always degrees. 90 degrees? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, I mean, there's there's chairs in, where you're less than, yeah. right? Or, or greater than, I guess, yeah. the, the range of motion. But yeah, it's just, to me, it's just so silly to to, to focus on that as the the degree of, of, of like anything past that is unsafe when in life, in general, we're going beyond that already. Right. Well, and so it's like, it's like this argument when people say, um, these exercises are dangerous and these exercises are safe. So don't do this exercise because it's dangerous. The truth is the thing that makes an exercise safe or dangerous is you. It's your body. Any movement, I don't care what the movement is, by the way, any movement that you have complete control over and mobility and stability with, any movement that you have those prerequisites with is safe for you. Any movement where those things are not there for you is now dangerous. A, bar, a dumbbell curl, the most basic, simple exercise that probably exists, if you lack the stability, the mobility, the connection to do a full dumbbell curl, that full dumbbell curl is dangerous for you. Now, I'll go with one of the more dangerous exercises, the Jefferson curl. Like, you look this one up, right? This looks like everything you're not supposed to do oh, yeah. with a barbell. You literally round your back on the way down. Yeah. This is an old gymnast Less exercise. Less than 1% of people can do it. Right, right. Look at that exercise. Looks super dangerous, and for most people, probably don't do it. But for people who can do it with good control, good stability, good strength, good connection, that exercise is well, very the, safe. The truth is, if you ever want to use that <laughs> range of motion at one point in your life, you should probably train it. You should train in it. And that to me, that was what was never communicated yep. to me as a young kid. And yeah. that would have been the game. That would have been it for me. If you would have just said that, say, if someone would have told me at 25, say, hey, Adam, if, if you don't work on getting to a place where you can squat down with a little bit, even just a little bit of weight on your back with good control and stability, you're going to lose that. And can, can you picture yourself, even at 20, right? Think way ahead. I'm going to think all the way to 40 because you don't have a kid till then. When you're 40, are you going to want to be able to squat down and, and play play Legos with your son without having to like hold yourself to the side because your back hurts so bad and switching from hip to hip because you're so uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. And do you want to be able to do that? Like, of course, if someone would have asked me that question, I'd say no, but no one's talking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you see these pages where we're just we're just talking about building muscle. We're just talking about building muscle. It's like, okay, I, don't get me wrong. I get that there is a community of people that that speaks to that they are in the sport of bodybuilding. And you know, you could ask a, yeah. a, a pro bodybuilder and he may say, I don't give a shit if I right. can't. If I, I just want to win. And whatever is going to get me there faster, and, and mo we'll take whatever stuff they right. can to enhance it. And truth be told, okay, working on the mobility, working on the the range of motion, it takes time. It's going to take. It's going to prolong the results, right? It may it may take a little longer to get to a place where your legs are as big, right? So for a guy or a girl who is in competition, who's now, and, and the reason for that is because you just can't load when you're working in that new range of motion. Right. Yet. Yet. Right. So it took time. You know, it, I, I took a good solid, I don't know, year and a half, two year hiatus from really lifting really heavy, working on, on mobility and getting that good control. But now I can, I can load the bar as heavy at a 90 degree squat as I can all the way down ass to grass. And I'm, it, and the thing is, Back to the, the 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 original point I'm trying to make that I think is so important is the majority of people that I know that I have that I trained even the ones that said all I really care about is building muscle if I would tell them okay if if we sacrifice this though are you still okay with that or would you like to have both because we can have both mm -hmm. right. we can actually get to a place 
where I can take you into a deeper range of motion, and then I can also make sure that you don't lose this movement that you may want to have at one point you, in your life. You know, it's funny. In the 90s, there was a book, and I can't remember the name of this book, but it was a book that came out that talked all about partial repetitions. And, and on the cover of it was uh, Paul DeMeo. He's a deceased bodybuilder now, but he was a bodybuilder from the East Coast. They called him Quadzilla, big legs. Short reps will kill you. And and, and yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a new book. No, something yeah, else killed him. I'm sure it had to do yeah. with all the, the drugs and stuff. Group training needs to die. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> in this book, and I can't remember the name of it, uh, all they talked about was how it's all about load and tension. Range of motion is not important. So in other words, let's say you could do a full squat with 200 pounds. You're going to get better results squatting half squats with 400 pounds because the load is so much higher. So this entire book was based off of this partial range of motion uh, philosophy. Well, it went nowhere. It went nowhere because it didn't work. The, the literature completely didn't support it. Um, range of motion is connected to muscle growth along with intensity and volume. But look, it's, it's, it's simple as this. A half curl is not going to build muscle to my bicep like a full curl. As the fibers move and stretch and move past each other, each point that they move past, there's connections that start to cause damage when there's load. If you're not fully extended, you're not getting the full capacity of that muscle. So full ranges of motion that are connected, again, remember the prerequisites I said, you, you got to be connected, stable, mobile, you got to have all those things uh, are part of the formula. If that's there, that greater range of motion, you are sending more of a muscle building signal. In fact, lighter weight with a greater range of motion is going to create is going to build more muscle than heavier weight with a shorter range of motion is so long as the intensity is equal. If they're both equally as hard, it's the larger range of motion that tend to build more muscle. That's and this right. is just a, an absolute fact and it's funny, you know, I, I, again, I learned this later on uh, as a kid training and I remember I uh, when I managed trainers, I loved managing trainers for a lot of different reasons. But one reason was I would see all these different trainers from different walks of life and it was really cool to learn from different fitness professionals. And, you know, I've, I've talked about the gymnast that worked for me uh, for a long time. And he was the guy that, you know, showed me that, you know, rever you know, curl grip, you know, curls is better for biceps than barbell curls and all that stuff. And I remember him doing all these like crazy range of motion exercises, like behind the neck presses back, back in the nineties when I was first a trainer uh, as a personal trainer, I was a huge no, no. Yeah. Everybody's like, don't do anything behind the neck. No pull downs behind the neck, no shoulder presses behind the neck. Yeah. Totally bad for you. It's bad for the shoulder. And, it, and yeah, I remember- It's going to destroy your shoulder. In fact, I had an instructor at one of my certifications, and he this was his, his visual. He took a towel. He had like this, this bath towel, and he twisted the bath towel, and he goes, this is what happens when you do behind the neck presses. And he goes like this, ah! with this twisted. <laughs> and I remember like, oh shit, that's going like, to be really? terrible. Really? That happens? Yeah. But anyway, this guy, this gymnast had incredible deltoids and would do this exercise. And I'm like, doesn't that hurt? And he goes, no, why, why would it hurt? He goes, I, I own the movement. And I remember thinking like, yeah. oh yeah, I, I've never done those before and I, I probably should go real light and see if I can get myself to be able to do them. And I did. I started with literally just the bar because I'd never really trained that way before. And gradually over time was able to add weight. And I saw incredible results on my shoulders yeah. from working through this new range of motion, even with the light weight. Here's the beauty of, by the way, training in new ranges of motion as you start to it's own them. It's novel again. It's novel. It's like a new exercise. It is. It's like, okay, when you first start squatting and you're, and you're brand new and beginner, it's not unheard of to add five or 10 pounds every single week to your lift initially, right? Those newbie gains, right? After you train for a while, it really starts to plateau. Obviously, you can't keep progressing that way. Otherwise, I'd be squatting 10,000 pounds by now, right? It doesn't work that way. So it's like, how do I tap into those newbie novel gains. One way to do it is to improve your mobility and connection and train in new ranges of motion. Because mm -hmm. here's what happens. Let's say all you ever do is squat to 90 degrees. And let's say you squat with 300 pounds. That's what you're you're kind of stuck at. That's what you work with. But now you're working on mobility. So now you got to back way the fuck down. Now you're down to 135 pounds and you're you know three inches below parallel and you're slowly working on mobility. Here's what ends up happening as that starts to work for you. You start to gain 10 pounds on your squat every single week again. And what correlates with that is new muscle growth mm -hmm. that starts to happen. You start to see new things happening. So, and again, I, the, the studies are quite clear on this. They've actually done studies on this and compared short ranges of motion to long ranges of motion. And the larger range of motion are just superior. And not just for the target muscle, but for all the muscle around. One thing I hate that bodybuilders say, which annoys the shit out of me, is they say, yeah, but I just want to target the quads mm -hmm. as if 
a deeper squat is going to take muscle away from the quads. No, I, at the very least, you'll build the same amount of quad growth. Yeah, and but then you'll, you'll get, get some, some hamstring, you'll get some calf, and you'll get some glutes to go. Yeah, with Yeah, you're it. gonna get more <laughs> muscle in other parts of your body. Yeah. Is, is that like a bad thing? Yeah. You know, well, I, I always, I don't know. I guess I was trying to think of an analogy for this, but like in terms of reinforcing like the weakest points of your body, like I just, I don't feel like that's a conversation a lot of muscle building enthusiasts have. Like, it, you can build so much more muscle when you actually address a lot of the stabilizing muscles that contribute to, you know, keeping your joints in the most optimal position. And it's amazing what happens, the amount of force that you can output once everything feels like it's not going anywhere. It's super sturdy. You know, like if it, you think of this with any other machines out there, what do you do to them to be able to increase their uh, load capacity? You reinforce them. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you're, you're right, because especially as you become more advanced, the num one of the, the number one limiting factors is lack of stability in your joints in your body. Your body will actually prevent you from getting stronger uh, because it knows you'll hurt yourself. Or, worst case scenario, you injure yourself doing you know your 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 routine exercises, in which case now, oh I, I you know pec strain. Oh, I got shoulder, you know, rotators. I can't bench press anymore. I can't squat anymore. I well, can't you, do these exercises. Are you, we have to talk a little bit more too in depth like about like Doug and I's experience with our low back because I didn't really uh, fully grasp this until I went all the way through this and, and then and, and now have a, a much better understanding because I think this point is the most important point is when you start to limit the range of motion in joints that should have a greater range of motion, mm -hmm. then when you call upon that in real life, then what ends up happening is other muscles yeah. overcompensate Compensate. for that. The overcompensation of other muscles ends up creating these deviations in your posture and, right. and you get these imbalances which then cause chronic pain so if you limit your ability to get full extension in your shoulders then what will end up happening is parts of your traps and your upper back will start to overcompensate and then it'll start to notice that i get t stiffness in my neck or my shoulders starts yep. clicking and hurting mm -hmm. all the time and it's related from you limiting that range of motion in your shoulder and the body starting to overcompensate the same thing happens in the hips mm -hmm. and causes the low back pain so even though you want to build all this optimal muscle and i want to focus Focus specifically on the quads. Do you, in order to sacrifice those things, are, are those not important to you? Do you want not want to deal with that 10, 15 years down the road? Because if someone would have communicated that really well to me when I was in 20, when I was 20, I'd say, yeah, I really do want to get buff. I really do want to build just my quads in this workout today, but I also don't want to be in that situation in 10 right. years because I didn't address it. Right. Now, now picture you sitting in that squat and like like playing with your son with Legos and you've only done 90 degrees and now you're trying to figure out now how to reach out in front of you and now your back is compensating, you know, and it's rounding a bit and all these things and you're starting to really feel that sharp pain in your back oh. versus sitting all the way down you have you own that position you're in control you can be in an upright position even and you know use your hands in front of Shit, you totally you, different you can't even do it no you can't you can't even do it you no, can't you just, yeah, you're falling a, forward yeah, you can't i mean i and i remember because i was there i was there. i remember when i first started working on this it uh and i think uh i think kelly starrett does this uh did this like challenge like can you sit in a squat for five or 10 minutes or something like that. Like mm -hmm. you'd be amazed how many people just can't get down there. Mm -mm. Yeah. They, they, their, their heels will rise off the ground. Their shins will be on fire like crazy. Their, their, low, their low back will be on, on fire. Their knees will be stressed and they'll pop out of it in about a minute at most. And that's just because that's how long they could tolerate the pain for. Yeah. Because they're not comfortably there. That, so that's most people. And a lot of that is because of information like this, because we're, we're telling people that are training in the gym, that are trying to improve their body, that they don't need to do this. It's like, okay, no, this is not a good message for anybody. Right. And, and even like you, you, your point, Sal, is that even if you are the competitive bodybuilder, you can still learn to get a greater range of motion and still build optimal muscle or more muscle that way. Right. But even, I mean, I, I think that everybody should right. consider that you because know, so you want to do these things. it's not an advantage any way you look at right. it. Right, right. And by the way, you know, I, I even talk about this a little bit in the, the book I wrote, The Resistance Training Revolution, where I talk about the stigma that surrounds resistance training in the sense that it makes you tighter, right? This whole myth that lifting weights will make you muscle bound. That was a term that they used to use back in the day. It made you muscle bound or made you tight. Now that came from people observing 
hardcore bodybuilders move in everyday life. And you'd see these guys and girls walking around. You'd be like, oh, they're tight. Look how they move. He can't even scratch his own ass or look how he turns and look how he's moving or whatever. Like, I don't want to move like that. Well, the reason why they move like that, they built a ton of muscle. They built all this armor around these kind of limited ranges of motion. And so that's the way that their body now moves. When people train properly with resistance training, you get better movement. You get better flexibility. Mm -hmm. If you do it wrong, well, yeah, you're going to start to cause uh, a lot of problems. I think we should start to give people some tips though, because I'm sure now that we've made the case and people listening are like, okay, I want to increase my range of motion. What are some steps that I can take to do that? Now, first off, I want to start calling this functional range of motion. Okay. So range of motion is how far you can do something. Functional range of motion is how far can you do something with control, tension, stability, and good mobility. Okay. So identify that for yourself first and foremost. So like you might be able to sit in a squat, but can you sit in a squat with all those prerequisites? If not, then find where your real functional range of motion is. That's the starting point. Now the goal is going to be can we increase that functional range of motion? That's yeah. the important thing. Inch by inch. Right. I well, mean, it's very gradual progression. And, uh, you know, I would I would start with things. I think that uh, Kelly Starrett with Supple Leopard did an incredible job here. I think, uh, I can't think of his the doctor or whatever. Dr. Who, Andrew Ospina. Thank you, who did uh, Ken Stretch. Um, th- these are things that, th- these changed my life. So th- that, that book, that certification absolutely changed my life as far as like what type of movements and exercises should I be doing in the gym or in your home in this case to complement what we're talking about right now? Because it isn't as simple as, oh, this is where my range of motion is. Try and challenge it by going a little right, deeper or right. pushing further. You there's there's a there's a neurological disconnect going on here. Yes. I am not I'm not neurologically connected to that new range of motion. So I need to train the brain first. Right. I need to train the brain. It's all brain training. How do right. I intrinsically create that tension when that, I need it? That's right. And that sounds really complex for somebody who has no idea what this is what we're talking about and seems foreign. And this is also why we did the webinars, right? So we have two free webinars. Uh the Maps Prime Pro one, probably a little more specific to what we're talking about today. Um, where I take you through, I think I took you through five it's or maps seven. Prime Pro webinar dot com. That's what maps Prime Pro webinar dot com, Doug. No, Prime Pro webinar dot com. Prime Pro webinar dot com. Webinar. Yeah, okay. Sorry, don't even know our own web- webinar. That's all right. Yeah, go to that. What follow that? It's free, and and go through that. Because and what's important when you do these these exercises? This is what I think the, the thing that I learned. Right, and then and this I should also credit Doctor Justin Brink too. So because Brink was the first person to take me through Ken Stretch and some of these movements. And he was very clear to me that, listen, Adam, we're training a a neurological connection here. So you can't just look at me in this position and then try your best to get in that position and, and sit there and relax like a yoga stretch or a static stretch. He goes, what you need to do is we, you need to intensify the, the you have to turn the muscles on. Yeah, and and it should be you should be working like an exercise yeah. the entire. You're contracting the muscle, but uh, that's something that you have to actively do while you're getting into the yeah, movement. Yeah, yeah, and and here's why, right? So when you stretch a muscle passively, like the old school stretches, right? So let's say I'm just like stretching my hamstring. So I'm gonna I'm gonna you know bend down, touch my toes, relax, and little by little I'll start to get deeper and deeper and deeper as my hamstrings start to relax and stretch out. What's happening is my central nervous system is getting this signal uh, that it's stretching. And it, first, it's tight because it's protecting. But then once it realizes things are safe, is it reduces this signal to my hamstrings. And my hamstrings start to slowly relax and open up. So the muscle itself is not becoming longer necessarily. It's just relaxing because the CNS signal is telling it to relax. Now, there's some benefit to that. And we can get to that in just a second. But w- what that's not doing is that's not increasing my functional range of motion. All that's doing is increasing my range of motion because my central nervous system is disconnecting in essence. Now, I know it doesn't really do this, but just for the sake of this uh, this conversation, it's disconnecting and allowing me to get a greater range of motion. What I want is functional range of motion. So the difference would be I'm doing that hamstring stretch. Then when I get a little bit more range of motion, I flex my hamstrings and turn them on. So now I'm telling my central nervous system, we have a greater range of motion, connect to this new range of motion. Now, earlier, Adam, you were talking about how you, you're, you don't even know how to connect to certain muscles. You're training your brain. Here's a great example of that, okay? 
if you've ever worked with anybody who just had a baby, and if you're watching or listening and you've, and you've had a baby, you know how weird it is to try to connect to your core muscles after the baby's born. Like, try to draw in your midsection or try to do a slow sit-up. Actually, don't do that because you might actually cause problems. Those muscles were so turned off in order to create space yeah. for the baby. They had to stretch all the way out. That when you go to reconnect to them, it's like a foreign muscle. It's like you. Lo it's almost like you unplugged the wire to the speaker and you're trying to get the speaker to make some noise. It's not going to happen because there's no connection. So the first thing you can do or you need to do before you go train it is get that connection to happen again. And that's what things like kin stretch are all about. And that's what tro proper mobility training is well, about. Well, another example of that for people that have never had a baby, but maybe have, have broken something right? Oh, right, and been casted up for a while. And yeah. you've been casted up, you know, let's say you broke your forearm or your leg or something, and you've been casted up for months on months. And we know one, uh, atrophy has happened, right? You, it looks like you lost everything. But then like you take the, the remember, remember the first time that cast came off and you, you're you like looking at your fingers. They're trying to tell it to move. Right, trying to tell them to move. And it's like they, they barely get, and it takes a while before yeah. you can start it's to like do It's like a it. weak signal. It's like right. barely even happening. That's right. And, and the reason why is because what has happened, because you would, you've been casted up, the brain realizes that and goes like, oh, we're not- We're we don't not, need it. We're not using this anymore. So we don't need it, and it prunes it off. And it says, I'm going to reprioritize neurons, other places in the body that we're using a lot of, and stop sending it over to this area that we're not using. That's what happens when you don't deep squat. You don't deep squat, and the brain goes, oh, we don't need that anymore. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to do that anymore, so I'm going to reprioritize it other places. If I understood that, like I know now, I would have never shortened my, I would have never done these little quarter squats. I would have always been pursuing a greater range, especially in a movement as fundamental as getting down in a squatted position. Right. And it's because, you know, and it, we all thought this, that strength had all, everything to do with muscles. It's the muscles that are strong. It's yeah. the, and that's, that's not entirely true. Uh, a, a, a lot of your strength comes from this signal comes from the central nervous system, the command center mm -hmm. that's telling the muscles what to do. And that builds just like muscles do. In fact, that builds before muscles ever build. When you first start doing an exercise, the first thing that starts to adapt is your central nervous system, is your brain, uh, or the, the, is the connection. That, that's why it's one of the reasons why your strength gains can be so fast initially without any accompanying muscle gains at first because you're learning a new movement, you're learning a new exercise. So if this is you and you're trying to increase your range of your functional range of motion, identify your limiting factors. Oftentimes the limiting factors have to do with joints that you might not think are are, are the problem. In other words, right. if I'm doing a squat and I'm, I can't go all the way down and I feel it and it's like, oh, why can't I go all the way down? It feels tight in my, my hips feel tight. Uh, it, the hips might be a part of it, but it also might be coming from your ankles and your feet. And the reason why your hips feel tight is because your ankles and feet don't have the functional range of motion to support a deeper squat. So what do you do? Do you practice deeper squats? Part of it, that's part of it, but really the bigger part of it is targeting those areas. So I would go down and do, you know, a combat stretch for my ankles. I would work on my foot connection. Um, I would work on my hip internal and external rotation ability. So I'm doing things like 90-90. I'm also lightening the load weight or doing no load at all and going a little deeper than I normally do and slow, going slow, focusing on connecting to that new range of motion. By the way, here's a great way to make that happen to you even faster. When you get down to a new range of motion that you're not entirely familiar with, but you're starting to get connected to, mm -hmm. don't put any weight on your back or whatever. Go there and hold that position. Hold it and squeeze. Yes. And really squeeze as hard as you can, like max effort squeeze. Like we're really trying to train the body to identify we need all the troops. We need to get more muscle fibers involved. We need to activate. And so that's a, a very valid method to then, you know, build a lot of strength support in that specific angle. It is. And whatever you this new functional range of motion is, is now treat this like a brand new exercise. What I mean by that is when you approach an exercise for the first time, there's a level of respect that you have like, okay, new exercise, got to go slow, focus on my form, focus on my technique, make sure you're cautious, 
Just because it's still a squat doesn't mean it's the same squat, right? It's a different exercise now. So the goal is to not push it. And here's the problem, and this is especially for the fitness fanatics, and I run into this all the time. You get a new range of motion. You start to feel good. The first thing you want to do is push the weight. That's when you hurt yourself. So you want to go very, very slow. Take your time. Allow this new range of motion to become very connected and then watch your body start to progress. And again, focus on those sticking points, but I love that tension mm -hmm. position. Get in that position, the new position, hold, tense, get your form and technique perfect, activate everything, teach your body to fire properly, and then slowly add weight, and then watch what happens. Yep. Look, if you like our content, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. Head over there and download our guides. We have a lot of free guides that help you burn body fat, build muscle, even become a better personal trainer. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Imagine if the goal was to be the best soccer player on the field or the best baseball player on the field or the best basketball player on the court. You would not go and practice your techniques with full intensity all the time. That wouldn't make you the best. You would practice the technique. And then occasionally you'd go hard. You play a game.